Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. People kind of go, what's the word for 2015? You know, and, and, and I don't discount that, but you can't always go around looking for that either. Uh, you have to follow after God, and God may give this ministry um, a word for their ministry or, or something specific to focus on. Um, sometimes we take it too far. Uh, we think that God's going to do stuff no matter what we do. Uh, I got news for you. God works with us and works in cooperation with us. Um, God gives us a plan and we're to follow after and, we're, and, and go a certain way. But they went everywhere preaching the word. The Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. So in the church, we have to cooperate with what God wants us to do. God doesn't do stuff in, uh, in the church. He's just, well, this is the year of the double. You know, you're going to get double no matter what. Well, if you don't cooperate, well, you're not going to get anything. Or you're going to get double what you're doing. Nothing. Two times nothing is nothing. We've got to hook up with the Lord. Can you say amen? So our, our church focus this year is on the visitation, manifestation, and demonstration of the Spirit. Well, we, we believe that in order for us to cooperate with the Holy Ghost, we have to grow into a deeper uh, walk with Him than, than what my classical Pentecostal roots would do. Um, now, as a, as a classical Pentecostal, now I was in one of the, one of the main Pentecostal denominations uh, as growing up, and then I got, you know, uh, uh, came into the word of faith, and uh, I don't discount my Pentecostal heritage. As a matter of fact, I count it as an asset. I thank God for it. Um, but, you know, came over one of the word of faith people, charismatics, and, you know, there's some things there that we've gathered and gained and, and gleaned from over the years. Uh, but don't discount any of it. You know, you just don't, you know, uh, those Pentecostals don't know anything. They knew more about the Holy Ghost than most word of faith people ever thought about. Uh, they, knew, they knew how, they knew some things about the Spirit of God. But one of the things that we did do is we began to relegate the Holy Spirit to something we could get a hold of. Um, it, he became more of a tool in our hands to uh, enable us, empower us, to bless us, instead of uh, us becoming, getting into his hands where he used us. He empowered us and used us to, to use us for his purposes. Amen. And so the Holy Spirit became um, uh, the power. We, we, talk, we want to talk about the power. We want to talk about, I got it. You know, we, uh, how many of you, ever, you know, we, we even sing that song, I got it. Something about that Holy Ghost. I can't explain, but I got it. I got it in my hands, got it in my feet. You know, and, and I understand that, but at the same time, and, and so if we ever sing that, don't get up to oh, pastor, say we should, I didn't say we shouldn't sing that. We got to have the right perspective on things. Amen? See, when we understand the Holy Spirit's a person, amen, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's, an, he's not an influence. He's not just a power that emanates from God. He is a divine being. Amen? He is referred to as, you know, the, uh, the, the third person of the, of, of the Godhead. We're to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He, Jesus equated him in an, in an equal status with the Father and himself. Amen? Hallelujah. So we're going to talk about, we're talking about, first of all, the person of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to the work of the Holy Spirit. But right now we're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. In other words, proving he is a person. Amen. One, one of the scriptures that is used uh, pretty readily in order to uh, devalue the Spirit is uh, the scripture says, The Spirit itself maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. And... Um, they simply say, because see, it says it. They say it's an it. I've heard people say that. It says itself. Well, you understand in the rules of translation, the key, and that's in the King James translators. Other translators actually don't do that. Some of them, not all of them you do that. They'll say the Spirit himself. Um, but the King James translators followed very strict rules of translators. Those, those 60 or so Greek scholars from Scotland, England, and Ireland got together for the King Jimmy Bible. How many know that the authorized version never officially ended up getting authorized? King James authorized the, the writing of it. He never authorized the finished product. Although they call it the AV, the authorized version. Hallelujah. I, I, so I refer to it as the King Jimmy. Hallelujah. Um, but they, they followed the very strict rules of English translation. And that was that if the noun is genderless, thus the pronoun must be genderless. And the word spirit is pneuma in the Greek is not a gendered word. It is a genderless word. Thus its pronoun, if you're following rules of translation or interpretation, uh, strictly, 
what the pronoun uh, of him, it, or her, uh, he, she, or it, would be it. All right? And so, but you can't go by that. You've got to go by other things. And so the body, the, the Word of God has a, a body of proof within itself that the Holy Spirit is a person. We, we got very, very uh, lightly into it last week. So we're going to go ahead and get into this. There are four major lines of proof from the Word of God that the Holy Spirit is a person. Now, the first line of proof is he has a personality. Now, I could go out here this afternoon, the wind blows. The wind does not have a personality. Are you here? You know, uh, your TV does not have a personality. Your telephone, I know they got Siri in there, but that's somebody's personality to put Siri in there. I talk to Siri all the time. I fire Siri. Anybody ever fired your, your, your Siri on your phone? And, you know, I do it. I fire Siri. She, you know, she don't get the answer I want to say, you're fired. And she'll go, who, 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 me? You know, but see, that's somebody put all that in there. You know, last, I think the other day I told her to go to sleep. She said, I can't sleep. I told her to take a sleeping pill. She said, that was not possible at this time. Anyway, <laughs> so that's on your iPhones. If you've got iPhones, you've got Siri on there. And it's just, a, it's just a data bank of stuff that are designed for responses. But it really, it really doesn't have a personality, okay? Uh, your car doesn't have a personality. We say that sometimes. My car's got a lot of personality. No, your car's got a lot of mechanical problems. Okay, that's what you're saying. You know, it, it, you know, it jumps, it bumps, it makes, it makes weird noises and all kinds of stuff. But it's not the personality of your car. Your car doesn't have a personality. All right? People have personalities. Now, when we define personality, we define it this way. Having knowledge, having feeling or emotion, and having will. Okay? Personality, so, the, you know, so this, we, I, we just brushed this last week. We'll go ahead and cover it back again. Knowledge. The Holy Spirit doesn't just present to us knowledge. He has knowledge. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Notice, he knows things to share with you. Amen? He won't speak because he'll share what he knows, what he hears. And what he hears for the Father say, what the Son says, he has obtained knowledge. The Holy Spirit has knowledge. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has, knowledge. has knowledge. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes in one place, it says he searches the things of God, yea, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit knows things. Amen? The wind doesn't know anything. Even Jesus said, he said, the wind bloweth where it listeth. In other words, it's just, it's just random. We don't know where it comes and where it goes. It just blows. It just, you know, there's, there's no, the wind doesn't purpose to do that. The wind doesn't have a meaning in doing that. You know, you know we, we talk about um, tornadoes or hurricanes. You know, the winds and those things have no purpose in trying to destroy stuff. That's just what they do because of why well, nature created something. But there's no, there's no knowledge. There's no, there's no purpose behind it. All right? The Holy Spirit knows things. He knows you. Yeah, he does. Amen. So, um, he has knowledge. Secondly, he has a will. I said the Holy Spirit. Now, now growing up classical Pentecostal, boy, we love the gifts. We love the, and even in the, in the charismatics, you know, uh, the, I used to call them the crazy-matics. Um, you know, we, we were lunatics. I mean, we just, you know, if we got a goosebump, that was the Holy Ghost. You know what? You know, I, you know the Holy Spirit operates with a purpose. He does not operate purposeless. He doesn't do things randomly without a purpose. There's always a purpose in what the Holy Spirit's in operation and doing. I know some of you that grew up as charismatics don't know that. Or even Pentecostals don't know that. You know, we just think the Holy Spirit just kind of comes and does. And, you know, and we're just kind of, ooh, it was wonderful. Woo, praise God, I got goosebumps tonight. God didn't come just to give you goosebumps. There's always a reason for something. Amen. And one of, the, re one of the, the, the main reasons of any manifestation or demonstration of the Spirit is to lift up Jesus. Because Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men into myself. The magnification of the Lord Jesus Christ is always uh, prominent in the mind of the Spirit so that men can be drawn to him so that they can be saved. So they can come into the kingdom. So even when we're having what we, we call Holy Ghost services... And there's, there's strong demonstrations or manifestations of the Spirit. The ultimate end is to lift up and magnify Jesus. 
Not so you can run outside and tell everybody, woo! We had it tonight. Man, it was going on tonight. Amen. It may have been going on tonight. There may have been something special tonight. But the purpose was not so you could just go off and talk about how just goosebumpy you got. Men, men and women have to come to Jesus. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says, But all these, now he's talking about the manifestations of the Spirit there, the operations, the giftings, the administrations of the Spirit. What we often refer to as the nine gifts of the Spirit. Prophecy, tongues, the interpretation of tongues, working of miracles, special faith, gifts of healings. Amen? Yeah. Amen. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. We refer to those as the nine gifts of the Spirit. Uh, they could be called manifestations or, of the Spirit or demonstrations of the Spirit. Um, uh, sometimes, and actually the word gifts in that chapter is to tell us that it's not in the Greek. So, you know, and, and one of the, I say that because a lot of times people think it's a gift of the Spirit. You know, I got the gift of prophecy. Well, you are used by the Holy Ghost as he willed to prophesy. But that doesn't I mean you got that as, that just you walk up anytime you want to and you can prophesy. You see, we, I, used to, I, I was brought up in, in a way that people believed that, you know. And, but the Bible doesn't bear that out. <clears throat> Amen. The Bible doesn't bear that out that you know that uh, you now got the gift of prophecy. You always have it. You can prophesy. You can't just prophesy anytime you want to. Why? He says here, uh, but these all work at that one and self same spirit, divided to every man severally as he will. They're manifest as the spirit wills. Man, if you, had gift, if you had gifts of healings, you could just do them anytime you want to. You just run around healing anybody anytime you want to. They still are manifest as the Spirit wills. That went over big. I mean, I, I had a roommate. My roommate story. My roommate at Bible school was always seeing angels. So he said. The Bible says the people who see angels are vainly puffed up in their head. You know? I mean, I'd, I'd be sitting somewhere, he said, there's my angel over there. You know, well, there's my angel over there. I mean, every time I turn around, he's seeing his angel, supposedly. You know, sometimes I wonder how many times he really saw an angel and he just, he just saying stuff. Now, the Holy Spirit, the, so the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. As he wills, as he designs, as he purposes, when he wants it. Amen. Amen. What do we do to help people when there's not a manifestation of the Spirit, such as gifts of healings or working of miracles? You follow the word. You give them the word. You teach them the word. Amen. Look, I've been, in, I've been in healing services where, you know, Brother Hagin was ministering under that anointing. And he would just stop. You got, got people in line. He'd just stop and say it just lifted. Amen. Now, he said, so, now, we, we, can, we can lay hands on you according to the word of God. You know, you lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He said, but that, that, that special anointing just lifted. What? Well, I mean, he's got that. No, if it lifts, it lifts. I've been, I've had the same thing happen. You're ministering to people and, it, and whatever anointing's on you just lifts. Why did it lift? Well, it could be numerous reasons. It could be people who grieved the Holy Spirit. It could be that, you know, I, I don't always have all the answers. You don't always have all the answers because the Bible don't give you all the answers on these things. And if it doesn't have them all, you don't have the answer to it. Amen. Yes. Amen. We do know we can give them the word. We can lay hands on people according to the word, just as, as, as Christians in, in accordance with what the word of God commands us to. But it always won't be with the, with the special anointing or a manifestation of the spirit. Amen. That's, right. That's as he wills. And boy, when it's there, it's just lovely. Amen. I'm just going to tell you, I mean, you feel like you got a tiger. You got a tiger in the tank and two by the tail. Amen. I mean, you, you, you think, my God, this is awesome. And, but when it's not, it's not manifest there, uh, you, you can still depend on the Word of God Amen. and trust the Word of God and still minister life to people. I've, I've had people get healed just because you're talking the Word. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. But he has a will. So, you know, without going into too, too much further that way, we'll get to some things when we get talking about the works of the Spirit. But he has a will. Everybody say the Holy Spirit has a will. And can I say something? His will, I'm going to get kind of country here. His will ain't your will. We are to yield to the will of God and not try to get God to yield to our will. And let me, you could try, but he's not going to, he's not going to budge. That's right. God is not 
called to submit to your will. Like one person said, stop trying to get God to bless your mess and just go ahead and do what he, do what he wants. It's already blessed. Amen. 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 People come up with ideas. I heard a woman one time, I mean, I, I, and, and so many of you, if I told you her name, you go, my God, you're kidding me. I was up at Brother Lester Summerall's uh, missions conference, uh, one of the very first ones he had back in the early 90s. And this well-known missionary and his wife were there. And uh, this guy, I got to talking, he started saying things like, you know, and he was trying to inspire all these young mission, people who come up to that missions conference, young missionaries to go out. And he said, you're greenhorns. You don't have what it takes. You can't drink the water. You can't eat the food. And he just went on, and I mean, he, you know, he's just trying to encourage everybody. To, hey, it's not all pie in the sky. It's, there's, there's some work to being a missionary, you know. I mean, he went when, when nobody was coming. His name, was, his name is still recognized around the world on the mission field. You still have second and third generation people who are saved through their families because he went to their nation and held 50,000 person outdoor crusades back when that wasn't a big thing. All right? Well-known minister. So um, they kind of, kind of kept talking on along, and then all of a sudden uh, they got talking about, you know, uh, something, and then the wife just pops up, and she goes, I give God ideas. And the husband turned and looked at her and said, you give God ideas? Yes, I give God ideas, and he likes them. Now, Brother Summerall, being the old bull of the China shop type minister he was, hopped up from his seat, ran up to the podium, grabbed them on the shoulders, pulled them back, stuck his head up to the microphone and said, they just got in and got off the plane, they're, they're tired, they're going to the hotel, we'll see you tonight. Well, he shut it down right then. Found out later for somebody who, who, who knows for sure, he almost lamb blasted her right there in front of everybody. But because of the husband, he wouldn't do it because he had tremendous respect for the husband. But he liked to flay the wife. See, we, we can get so cocky. Let me, let me, and we're the faith people. Let's not get so cocky about our position in Christ. That who we are in Christ. Don't forget the term is in Christ. Amen. Outside of Christ, you ain't hitting on a whole lot. Are you here? You know, you know we, we got, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I've got authority. No, you've got authority in Jesus' name. You don't get to just go around and say, demon be gone. Jesus said, in my name you'll cast out devils. Amen. There, there is this propensity in humanity to take it to the extreme. And you cannot do that. The spirit of God manifests as he wills. You're not in charge. I know for some of you that's a revelation. You're not the big dog. I know I have seen that. My nickname on my cell phone is Big Dog. Uh, Siri calls me Big Dog. I say, Siri, what's my name? You are Ed. But because we're friends, I get to call you Big Dog. <laughs> Makes me feel good. Anyway, that's, that's what the, when I substituted the school, the, the, uh, the school uh, in the PE department, the kids all call me Big Dog. That's my nickname. So uh, I have Siri call me Big Dog. So she knows who's in charge. I might be in charge of Siri, but I'm not in charge of the Holy Ghost. It's his will that we're to be submitted to. We don't come up with our will and try to get him to submit and make that happen. Amen. A lot of people are praying things out that they didn't pray right to start with. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just let y'all think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. What do you mean you didn't pray, get, pray it right to start with? A lot of times you didn't even go to God and ask him if that was okay. Now, there's things you don't, have to, you don't have to ask God, is it all right, his will to heal you? We know the Bible says that. Right. You don't have to ask God, is it okay for somebody to get saved? We know that's his will. But how about, you know, bless God, I want to have a, 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 I have a desire to have a house on the Riviera. Well, maybe God has other plans for your life than the Riviera. Amen. Now, a number of years ago, we had somebody in our church on staff, and um, they got to wanting to go somewhere else and pastor. And so they began to pray that out. Now, listen, they, they, never, they never submitted it to God. They just began to pray that they had this place, and they started praying about this place, and they started confessing this place, and started declaring this place, and started believing for this place. And um, 
I mean, and, and they prayed themselves right out of a relationship with our church. You can do that. You can pray yourself out of a relationship where, the, where the, now this, I'm, I'm talking about the will of God. I know this hasn't, well, it does. It has exactly what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit has a will. And they, they, because they just kind of got this spur in them about this, they started praying about it. And then, you know what? Other ministers start praying, oh, you're going there, and it's going to be this, it's going to be that. Listen, amazing that their pastor wasn't getting that. And see, somebody said, well, you were just being selfish, you didn't want to lose them, yada, 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 yada. People come up with all kinds of reasons. Uh, you know, it's amazing how other people can all of a sudden have, have your best interest at heart when you know, they get a chance to speak into your life. Anyway, they got to pray in this thing, pray in this thing, pray in this thing, and their hearts turned towards what they were praying about. See, you can push something out. Israel wanted a king. It wasn't God's will. But because they pushed it and pushed it, he gave them a king. And it caused them nothing but trouble. What does that mean? It never was God's will. The king was never his will. He gave them what they wanted because they, they just bombarded him with it and kept fussing about it. So, resigned from staff. Church received an offer for him. Wasn't, wasn't, a really, wasn't really major, special, big, in, big anything offer. And um, quit, you know, quit working at the church. No income. Going to go down and do, you know, reconnaissance trips and get all these things. Okay, all right, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. About six weeks later, I come back from vacation. I've been on a vacation. I got, I got a note on my door. I got to talk to you tonight. I call him. Come on over to the office. I'll talk to you. And uh, I lived back up here in front before we remodeled. It was a small office, but it was still in the office. Met with, with just the husband. And he's, he's struggling. I mean, things are tough. You know, you're six weeks without money. And, uh, you know, I just looked at him and I said, you know what? I said, you know, God loves you. God, God will fix it for you. Uh, Israel won the king and they, get, they got a king. I said, it may not be in his perfect will, but, you know, they, they got the king. And, you know, he, when the king was doing right, he would bless them and so forth. And, and I just kind of just, just encouraged me, you know, you know, if you've made a mistake, God, God can fix the mistake, you know. And I um, just sent him on the way. Came to church the next morning. And uh, back at that time, I would always park before I would remodel my office and I have it, I have it set up. I'd come, we'd park back here and come in this room. That was our green room right there. We'd just come in there and sit in there and, and come out to the platform from there. And uh, church was arranged a little bit different. We had two sections instead of the four. And um, so you had a big aisle in the middle and, and one's on the walls. And they were sitting on like the second row here. And I just kind of, I would always kind of peek out the door, see what was going on out here just as I got here and so forth, and somebody had already taken over worship. We, you know, they were no longer the worship leaders and that kind of thing. And I looked out, and I am telling you, how many have ever seen Pig Pen on, on Peanuts Gang? Yeah. You know, the cloud of dust that hangs over them all the time? I look out, and I see the wife, and I'm telling you, Pig Pen showed up and sat on her shoulder. I mean, you're, you're, you're seeing into the spirits what you're doing. Obviously, that wasn't there. There wasn't dust flying around, but in the spirit, it was like dust all over them. That cloud, that dark cloud. So I sit in my office and I'll sit back here and go, okay, okay. Then, then the church starts and, and then I come out on the platform and I, I used to sit on the platform. Stop doing that. Why did you stop doing that? Because looking at y'all sometimes can, can make you, you know, when you're worshiping like this, like you're the walking dead. So we're supposed to be full of life. It'd be nice if y'all came to church like, woo! I mean, you're like a whole full gospel businessman, you know? Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. They got, oh, all these men standing in front of the building waiting for the door to open, singing Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Now you come to church sometime and it's, you know, you feel like you're a hee-haw, you're gloom, despair, and agony. Anyway, we shouldn't be like that. Amen. Amen? All right, well, when we get through this Holy Spirit's teaching, we're going to be full, you're going to be charged back up. So anyway, I, I get up on the platform, where, and, and, and of course, when I get out here and I'm out here and, and I'm looking, and I'm constantly looking, boy, I mean, line, I mean, pig pen is taking over. And I said, Lord, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take up an offering for them. I was going to stop the worship service and receive an offering for them. I really was. 
And I've, and, and like I said the other day, very few times I've ever had something like this happen, but he, he didn't just kind of impress me. He went, no! I, when you, he says no like that, you don't ask why. You say, yes, sir. <laughs> you just don't, you don't argue with the Lord. When you get a no like that, I love you, Lord, and I, you know, you just get to worship and you leave it alone. Because I was getting ready to stop that service right there and do that. Well, doesn't God love them? Well, hold on to your seats. We went on, finished worship. I came up, you know, made the announcements. We got ready to receive our offering. And when we received our offering, I saw the wife reach into her purse and take out a few, a few coins and put it in the offering as it went by. And as soon as that happened, the Lord said, now you can receive an offering for him. I thought, well, why wouldn't you let me do it? But there's a reason why you could, you know. There had to be an act of faith on their part. See, if I had done it, it had been done out of compassion and not out of faith on their part. It's okay if it's all right with the Lord, but it wasn't all right with the Lord that day. And so I stopped, you know, after we received, I stopped and came up and took over and began to say some things. And uh, said, you know, now, so people come to church and say, hey, they're not supposed to leave. They're not supposed to do this. They're not supposed to do that. They were, just in my, they were in my all the time. I said, listen, I, I, they have to hear from heaven. And uh, I started talking. They were sitting there. I said, we're going to receive an offering for them. Because the Lord, you know, the Lord just released me to do that. So I said, you two come over. We've got two seats and sent them up in front of the church. Some, one person gave their whole paycheck. We had about 70 people here today. We gave $2,800. Why don't you take up offshore everybody all the time? I have learned that when the Lord's in it, it's a blessing. If you do it sometimes, it messes them up. Because they just begin to expect that instead of using their faith. So anyway, but when the husband got up, he turned to the wife and said, you know we're not going, don't you? They were going to Charleston. And then afterwards, and they, 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 they received the offer, and they actually told him how much it was. They were still sitting up here. And she, she began, he came up and said, I'll be eternally grateful to you. You know, he said, last night I came to see you. He said, he said I couldn't sleep last night hearing those words. Israel wanted a king. So I, was, I, was, I, was, I was kind of going down this line about some things. But one of the reasons was they prayed some things out and got their will involved and couldn't ascertain the will of God. Because they pushed it so far and never kept it submitted to him. And so they had to be brought back to a place. And it wasn't that God was trying to break them. It's that they had to be brought back to a place where they could hear God. And God took care of them. Hallelujah. Amen. And um, he said, I, I, I wrestled with that all night. Israel wanted a king. I don't want to have, just have a king. I want to be in the will of God. Well, good. You know, I want you to be in the will of God, too. Then the wife said this. I w he said to me, we're not going, and I couldn't let it go. She said when the offering came in, something broke, and she was able to let go of it. And, it, and, it, and it admitted they had prayed it out so far. They had prayed that into their lives, although it wasn't God's will. You can get yourself out of the will of God praying when you pray your will and not his will. Jesus went to the Father and the God of Gethsemane. And he said, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, he, he didn't stop there. Because if he had done that, he would have prayed himself out of going to the cross. Think about it now. He said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But then he added this, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And, he, and once... He committed to the will of the Father. He was as a lamb before the shearers who opened not his mouth. He didn't open his mouth anymore. He, he just stood silent about it. Why? Because his will, he, he was wanting to, he didn't want to go. But he had to yield to the will of the Father. And the Holy Spirit yields to the will of the Son. And we're to yield to the will of the Spirit. He has a will. And I said, you know, we can pray ourselves out of the will of God by praying things out a certain way without first submitting it to God. 
Amen. I said, Amen. Dad Hagen used to tell a story about the man uh, who would come to the, he, he, would get, he would get right with God and then backslide. And he'd get right with God and backslide. And he'd get right with God and backslide. And uh, what it was is every time he got, he got right with God and got to praying, he sensed this call to Africa. And he didn't want to go. Now, now, my mama tells me all the time, stay off them airplanes. And I, and I mama, I am safer at 33,000 feet in the will of God than I am in my living room out of the will of God. Well, I guess you're right. But you need to stay out there, Mary, but Mama. I'm safer at 33,000 feet in the will of God than I am sitting in my living room out of the will of God. If he tells me to go to, go to Estonia or go to, to uh, uh, Europe and minister in the Bible schools, then I'm supposed to go. I go. Because it's the will of God. Now, if it's a joy, if it's a joy trip, you know, but I'm going on, on, on God's business. I had a high school uh, friend, uh, friend a year younger than me. Uh, the, a couple of years ago, he was killed in his living room down in Little Aid in North Carolina. Uh, bad storms came through, and a tree fell right on him and killed him right in his chair. Just sitting in his living room. Well, he's safe. He's in, he, he could have been up in there at 33,000 feet. Would have, you know, could have been safe there. <coughs> Amen? I was going to tell you. Oh, anyway. Um, this man got to pray, and every time he got to pray, Africa would get on his heart. And he'd backslide. He'd want to go to Africa. He'd just, he'd just stay out of church. He would stay out of church to keep from having to deal with the call of God or God dealing with him about something. Now, isn't that stupid? And so finally, after, after doing this for years in his life, he's down at the altar one night praying, and he, says, he just starts screaming, All right, God! Okay, God! I'll go to Africa! And as soon as he did it, I'm telling you, as soon as he did it, the Lord spoke to him and said, I don't want you to go. All I wanted was you to be willing to go. <laughs> he could have been serving God all them years and not having to backslide stuff because uh, all God wanted was for him to be willing. We, Janie and I had a similar experience along this line. We had been married about three years before Jessica was born. And, um, and, and in our church, my, my pastor's brother, um, his brother had, was a Raymond graduate, went after Janie and I went. But he, he got uh, hooked up with my, the denomination. I, he got hooked up with the Pentecostal Hole in his church and was got involved in their missions department. And they were getting ready to head up a missions team to Mexico City. Uh, Mexico City at that time was projected by the year 2000. It didn't happen, but the, the statistics back at that time, about 1982 or three, was that Mexico City would be 25 million people by the year 2000. And so they were going to send in a church plant team, him being the head lead missionary, and we're going to set up church plant teams to get Mexico City ready for this huge revival they knew they were going to need to have. It. And it's still, it's still a huge city. It just didn't reach the 25 million. You know. And it's sitting in a dormant volcano. So it's horrible air quality. I mean, just, you know, because the air sinks in there and doesn't rise out. You can't, it's just smog. And <clears throat> everybody has their house, houses full of plants to absorb the smog. Because it's just, it's just terrible. And, uh, the, and uh, we had gone to this missions conference up at Brother Summerall's, and me, him, another person, church, and the pastor, we had gone to that missions conference, and on the way, and on the way back, he started talking about, to me about me and Janie going with him on the team. And so we, we kind of got talking about it, and my pastors are going, you know, yeah, hey, that's a great idea, you know. And uh, next thing you know, we we've said, yeah, we're going to go. And uh, so we're talking about going, and of course I was going to have to join the Pentecostal Holiness Church again. I had given up my membership when I left and came to the charismatic Word of Faith Church in town. And um, I had to go to South Carolina and meet the missions director of the Worldwide Missions. And um, had to speak for about two or three minutes in front of about 5,000 people. Of course, you know, you're young and cocky. What? Praise God. We're going to Mexico. We're taking it for Jesus. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're on fire for God. Hallelujah. We got it all. We got the goods. I'm the man of faith and power. They've been waiting for me. Only problem is... We have to go to England for 10 weeks. Now, Janie, at that time, had not overcome the fear of flying. She has since. We've gone to Europe several times together. But that time, she, I, I'll go, but I ain't going to England. I ain't flying over there. See, I ain't flying over all that water. You know. So we, we, we go to uh, Dave and say, hey, look, you know, we, we want to go, but we don't want to have to go to the school. And uh, he, he talked to the guy. 
And this, this is at the meeting where we're, we're here, and he talked to the guy and said, no, he's, they got to go to the school. You got, they, you had to, they had to prepare you to go what it would be like to be a missionary. You can't just go down there thinking you got it. You find out what you don't have. They start bringing you monkey brains or whatever. You can find out what you got or don't got. Anyway. Yeah. And some of that stuff in Indiana Jones ain't too far-fetched. Anyway. So they come out and say, you got to go. And, um, and so Janie cries, and she said, okay, I'll go. So we said, we're going to go. We, 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 we're, we're go. we start raising our money, you know. And I'm praying about it, you know. Really, the first time I started praying about it. Because the only time I just kind of went with it. You know, this is, oh, this is great. I'll open door. We're going to go preach. We're going to go to Mexico. You know, we're going to go on a five-year plan. We're going we're to do stuff for Jesus. You know, this, when you love the Lord and you're called to God, you want to do stuff for Jesus. Amen. I still do. Amen. Amen. I, I'm, I'm not ready to retire. Somebody asked me recently, are you ready to retire? Are you, have you thought about retirement? I'm going, I got too much stuff to do. There's too much in here. I got, I got to help people. Amen. You know? I'm not ready to retire. I'm ready to re Actually, I'm ready to refire. We're going to take it up a lot, notch, get more done. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. So anyway, um, I get, and I start getting this weird feeling. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, we've done told him we're going. I did. And then that story Brother Hagen comes up, and I start getting this. I didn't want you guys, I wanted you to be willing. I'm thinking, oh, no, whoa, 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 whoa. So finally, after about several weeks of this, I'm like, beating my head, struggling, what am I going to do? Because I, 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 I mean, up until now, now all of a sudden I'm like, uh, I'm not supposed to go. What am I going to do? I called my pastor and said, we, we and Janie got to come talk to y'all tonight. We got to talk to y'all right now. So, so I called him up, went over, sat down. I said, look, I know I told Dave we're going. I know we told the Pentecostal Holiness Church we're going. I said, but ever since we had we told them that and gotten to that meeting, I said, I've been praying, and I keep getting this uneasy feeling. And uh, he said, what's the same? Well, I said, that just, I had this real strong sense that maybe we're not supposed to. I said, but I'm thinking maybe just cold feet or something. I said, so, but, you know, you tell me. I said, if you tell me not to go, we won't go. And he didn't even hesitate. He went, don't go. And I'm thinking, well, where's the long explanation? You know, you're thinking, you know, I've been struggling here for, for weeks. I need something more than don't go. He said, my wife has been in my ear since the beginning saying they're not supposed to go. I said, okay, we're not supposed to go. Amen. Now, see, sometimes you have to pray things out and find out. You just can't keep going. And listen, how do you pray things out? You don't start praying, Lord, we're going to be successful. Lord, we're going to have masses. Lord, we're going to have a million. Lord, we're going to have this. Lord, until what? Until you know for sure that's what God wants you to do. Before then, you say, Lord, what's your will? Now, I'm sensing this. Some of these things we just got, you know, the Holy Spirit has a will. He, he'll talk to you. I see he will talk to you. He's not a force. He's not an influence. He is a person. And when you begin to commune with God about things and about the will of God, the one that searches the heart of God reveals the heart of God to you and the will of God to you. Amen. The will of God. And so we didn't go. I don't regret not going. I don't regret the path God's brought us on. God's brought us through some, brought us in places and brought us in connection with people. And I've traveled the world. I've gone as far around the world as you can go. I went to Bangkok, Thailand. That's exactly halfway around. You can't, if, if I had gone any further, I'd be coming back. I'm, I'm serious now. It's 12-hour time zone difference. When it, was mid, it was noon there. It was midnight here. Boy, you're talking about easy. Didn't you have to change your watch? I mean, it was, it was easy to figure out that it was 12 a.m. or 12 midnight because of the sky. All right? Been all over the world preaching the gospel, t teaching in Bible schools, ministering Jesus. Praise God. And I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I followed after God. Did what God had for me to do, you know? And uh, uh, had, had Mexico City been his will, we would have been blessed. But it ended up not being his will. But it was, it, it was a good idea. You know, good ideas aren't always God ideas. Amen. Amen. So we have to ascertain the will of God. The Holy Spirit is your friend. 
He's a person who can talk to you about the will of God. And we need to understand this. We're not trying to get him to bless what we want. Now, listen, folks, there's a lot of teaching in, in our circles, in the charismatic order of faith circles. You know, uh, the Lord give you the desires of your heart. You just make sure your desires are the right desires. I like one guy I took put a little twist on one time, and he said, uh, God will put his desires in your heart. Not, not necessarily, you know, because listen, a lot of people come up with any little whim comes up, and they, that's the desire of my heart, and, and therefore uh, God will give it to me. Well, what if it's somebody else's wife? He won't give that to you. That's ungodly. As a matter of fact, Jesus said you committed adultery if you want somebody else's wife. Amen. Don't even have to have her, just warn her. Well, y'all got quiet. Y'all ain't like the first church of the frozen chosen right now. Amen. It's true. I said it's true. No, God doesn't give you little, every little whim that just floats up out of you. And you say, ah, I, I have a desire. I want that. I want a Lamborghini. God will give it to you. What do you need with a Lamborghini? Can you afford the, car, the, the oil changes? Anybody know how much it is to get a tune-up on a, on a Jaguar? Or Jaguar? $1,200. Tune-up. We're not talking a mechanical problem. We're just talking a, a maintenance issue of tuning it up. $1,200 on a Jaguar. A Lamborghini costs about four times as much. Rolls Royce, remember Bentley's, Rolls Royce's? You couldn't fix them. If they broke down, you called them and they flew a guy in and they hauled it in somewhere. You didn't get it fixed on the side of the road. Their mechanic flew in. You know, I have a desire for this, I have a desire for that. Why don't you measure your desires against the will of God? Why don't you submit them to the will of God? See, in our teaching on prosperity, we got to the excess. Everybody was going to have uh, Robert Leach or whatever his name was show up and do a show on their house. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. It's Ed Taylor, pastor of Faith and Victory Church. His $65 million mansion. Come on now. Every preacher in the world, all of a sudden, well, you know, they had to have the best. They had to have, they had to have this. They had, I had a desire to have a you know, seven-car garage. I can't even keep the two-car garage clean, much less the seven one. Hello? You won't get a seven car, you better believe for the servants to take care of the other five bays. We, we went to crazy stuff. People just started counting up how many things they could have, and they, ne they never were yielding things to the will of God. They weren't submitting to the things of God. Well, God doesn't mind if you have prosperity. Yeah, but he sure minds if it has you. He minds if you're obsessed with obtaining things for yourself instead of advancing the kingdom. He doesn't mind if you have the stuff doesn't. But he does mind if they have you. Well, how do you know if it has you? If you go and you got to have and you got to have and you got to have and then you get and he says, well, I need that for the kingdom and you're like, no, that's, that's, get behind me, Satan. I need that car. I need for you to sell it and give the money to the church for the key, work of the kingdom. Now, if you do, if you turn right around and sell it and give it to the church, okay. But if you hold on to it and resist him, then it's got you. Now, here's, 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 the, here's the cool thing is, if you, if you take it and sell it and give it to him, he'll take care of you. You don't have to worry about that. But you can't let it have you. So we, we, talking about the will of God, we need to be submitting things to the Holy Spirit. We need to take a step back and take a breath and stop running around and trying to count. You know, I gave $10 on offer. I got a hundredfold return. That's $10,000 coming back. Ooh, praise God. Eat ba 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 Glory to God. I got a $10,000 return coming. E glory. Get on Facebook. Somebody's going to give me $10,000. E praise God. Hallelujah. And what are you going to do with the 10? Now, listen, I'm not kidding, preaching against prosperity. I believe in it. I believe in biblical prosperity. I don't believe that the preacher has to walk out of here with, you know, you know $25,000 shoved in his coat pocket, his shirt pocket, his pants pockets, a bag hanging over his shoulder. Everybody gave him an offering that night and, uh, so that they could get blessed. That's just, that's just some, there's some things about that that bother me. 
Well, you're a preacher. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody would like to have somebody give them $25,000. I don't think there's anybody in this room that if I ask you, would you like for somebody to give you $25,000? You go, no, I don't want $25,000. Everybody here would want it. Amen? But I don't believe we can manipulate people into stuff. I think people need to pray and ask God. Things. Where do I invest my spiritual money other than my church? You just don't give to every preacher on the television. And you don't give at the expense of your local church. And I'm not just talking about ours. If you go somewhere else, you don't give to a ministry at the expense of your local church. Your local church is where you go. That's where your storehouse That's where your pastor is. That's who takes care of you. That's who feeds you spiritually. That's who comes to the hospital and visits you. That's who marries your children. That's who buries your relatives. Amen? That's, that's your local church. That's the storehouse of your life. That comes before anything else in giving. Just because somebody puts something on television and says, We're, you know, you give this offer, you're going to get $100,000 next week. Christians can be silly. Anyway, we have to submit to the will of God. We have to be... Uh, sensitive to the will of God. We have to yield to the will of God. And it can't always be about our will and our desires and our wants. Somebody say amen. amen. I don't know how I got way over there on that, but it's still good. Because if we'll, if we'll learn to follow after the will of the Spirit, we'll stay in. You know, it's, it's just easier. Now, I've driven to Tulsa a number of times since 1980. One of the easiest places in America to find. Because you take I-40 West until you get to the Muskogee Turnpike and you turn north on the Muskogee Turnpike and you go 72 miles and you're in Tulsa. That's it. One turn. I mean, you know, you understand what I'm saying. But there's only one, there's only one route turn on the entire trip. That is Muskogee Turnpike. Now, if you count Memphis, get on the 240 and going around, but that's 4240 going around. All right. Other than that, it's a straight shot. But I have deviated before. Don't deviate. We, there was a road construction a few years ago when the girls were out there, and we went out, and we took uh, US 70. It runs parallel to 40, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, actually. And uh, went down US, US 70 in Arkansas, down there in the middle of Arkansas, before you get to Little Rock is asphalt poured on a dirt road. It's leaning, it's bumpy, it's... I mean, you're riding across, you're going, my Lord, you need to be going 25 to ride this road. We did that to get around the, the, the stopped up traffic and stuff, but you know what? That was a deviation I didn't enjoy. And I haven't done it since. And I'll find another route if I ever have to go around again. I'll go up and come across on some other interstate somewhere and come back down. I'm going to take you taking 70. We don't want to get off on the wrong road. Sometimes you get off on the wrong road, it's rough. Yeah. Just stay on course. Stay on track with God. Well, how do you stay on track? You get, your, you get your map out. Get your atlas out. I don't even trust the GPSs because some of those are off. <laughs> Turn right. That's a lake. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Turn right here. But there's a lake. 300 yards is your destination. Is it Atlantis? Hey, I do it. Is it down on the bottom? I still like my maps. Hey, Amen. I like to visualize. I like to see it. God has your map for your life. It's his will. And if we follow after his will, we'll stay on track with God. Amen. Well, the Holy Spirit has a will. Amen. And we're to follow him. We're not to try to get him to get to, to honor our will. We're to honor his will. Why? Because we are to submit ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Amen. He'll direct your paths. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, 
P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.